I'm Lenny Hart, and you're listening to Zachary Borrego, Bad Moon Rising! All right, we're here today with the Deep Megaton Champion, just defended at Deep Impact 88, soon to fight at Ryzen 16. Mr. Rocky Martinez, how are you? Uh, good, good, good. Thanks for having me on again. Right on, man. With nothing but a pleasure. Thank you so much. So uh, let's talk about uh, your last fight real quick, Rio Sakai. Um, you took a couple shots in that fight. I read somewhere that maybe it was one of the hardest you've been hit. Is that true? Yeah, actually, man. Um, I mean, I'm pretty surprised about it, but that's probably the most I can. I could, yeah, I'd say that's the hardest I've been hit, and um, I mean, I could tell it was a, definitely a hard punch. Mm. Um, I felt it, but at the same time, also, it, you know, I just smiled down and kept going forward. Not nothing that uh stopped me, you know. Right, I might have woke you up a little bit, huh? Yeah. Hey, let me ask you real quick before I forget. Do we know what the deal with Deep is and why their production is not the same as Deep Jewels? Did you ever find anything out? Yeah, no, I actually haven't. You know, um, I'm wondering if it's, you know, maybe Deep Jewels is kind of their, uh, maybe it grabs more attention in Japan. Um, well, that it, would be it used to be. I, I, I'm trying to think back. You probably even fought for one. It used to be on Ustream, and they did have different camera angles. You caught your replay, I'm sure. Uh, most people, you know, Victor Henry's people, thought it was just someone recording from the crowd. But actually, it's just a camera on a big tripod, you know, that they, they look at the big screen sometimes. But uh, yeah, well, I was wondered about that because the Deep M or the Deep Jewel show was before that, as you know. And then uh, and then Impact and Deep Jewels had a commentary team. And, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, man, I wish they would, you know, do the same thing. Do you uh, have a Maybe they have a bigger fan base with Jewels and they know more people tune in. I don't know what it is. That's possible. I know that a few years back that there used to be a subscription model for, for Deep Impact. And you'd pay so yeah. much to get access to their Ustream, right? Uh-huh. And so anyway, uh, I just wanted to ask you about that. But uh, what, uh, what what was that event like, Rocky? How how did you feel going into it? Did you feel overtrained, anything like that? Uh, no, not really. I think the only thing I look back now on, Actually, immediately after the fight, I was kind of, uh, not kind of, I was pretty disappointed in my performance, actually. Um, I just kind of had this thing that I think, uh, you know, I was, I had it set in my head that I was going to finish the guy in 30 seconds, and I I was so firm on that, and I kept telling my corner, and, and it, it wasn't anything about being over, uh, or being cocky or anything yeah. like that, it was just I had so much confidence. And at the same time, I wanted to prove that uh, I felt like he didn't belong in there with me. And um, I think once it passed that 30 seconds and, I, you know, in my head, I knew that he survived past 30 seconds. Um, I think I just started, you could tell I started getting frustrated and just kind of chasing him down, throwing wild shots as opposed to like, uh, I, I'm, I felt like I'm a pretty high volume striker. And I, I went away from that and I was just looking for that one shot kill. One and, thing. Uh, one thing I feel, if I could butt in for a second, is just that you're really always technical with your hands up. And there was a couple times where you were kind of jogging at him, you know, trying. So I could tell that maybe I was like, is Rocky urgent to finish the fight? What is going on uh, here, you know? Yeah, I was definitely urgent. I was I, urgent to finish the fight. And uh, and I think um, I just got a bit frustrated during the fight and kind of turned into a little bit of a, you know, a sloppy, um, somewhat of a slugfest, but... Well, and, and you're your yeah. worst critic, you know. You weren't even happy with your Jerome LeBanner uh, victory at Ryzen, you know. Yeah. That was a good victory, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, I always just look back, man, and I always felt like you could, I could perform better, and I think that's a good way of looking at it too, you know. Um, one person that comes to mind when I think of that type of mentality was, um, and I really, you know, I man, I'm a huge fan of his, was Cain Velasquez, man, that guy. He was smashing through guys like nonstop, and after every fight, he just kept saying, "Oh, I'm not, and I'm not." Um, he wasn't satisfied, and I think when you know what you're capable of, and you don't, 
um, do that come fight night, you, you, it's hard to be satisfied when you know you didn't perform at your at your best and what you're capable of. And for me, that last fight was definitely, uh, you know, I, I definitely didn't perform to my best ability. Would did you say? Would you say that you felt a little pressure? I mean, you're kind of saying that you visualized, uh, you know, this thirty second thing. That was probably through the months of training. Um, would you say that after that elapsed, you you put more pressure on yourself? Yeah, definitely. Once he passed the thirty seconds, I was like, thinking in my head, man, this guy lasted thirty seconds. So obviously, I'm not as good as I. I was, I was, right, so. That's funny to me because it's only 30 seconds, man. I mean, you still finished the guy. And, you know, I thought once you had him on the back foot, you know, that's where you were doing excellent was – but you, I'm sure you know you, you can't punch as hard, I'm sure, on your back foot. You know, I don't know anybody that can, you know. Yeah. And so he was he was backing up quite a bit. But, uh, yeah, he hit you with some shots, and I was like, put up your hands, Rocky. You know, what's going on here? Because you usually, I mean, in all in all your fights, you're you're real technical with always throwing the combinations, but keeping your hands up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just wondered about that. Uh, do you have a contractual obligation with them to defend this title? Um, no, I'm I'm not currently on contract with Deep. It's just kind of um, it's it's an option that I like having with them. That you know, if they ever want me to defend my title, I'm always up for it. Hell yeah! Um, well. Hopefully, with the growing heavyweight scene in Ryzen, you know, maybe maybe we're going to get a heavyweight title this year. I know that they're they're really trying to incorporate titles, and so uh, that's that's what we're hopeful for. Which leads us to your matchup. Uh, well, well, let me ask you this: after that, what, what did you do right after the fight? Um, well, after the fight, I kind of just relaxed that night. We actually left the following day. Um, the following day, I came home. I think it was early Monday morning. Just kind of relaxed. I took off of work. Or no, actually, I went back to work on Monday. <laughs> I was supposed to take off, but I had to go back in. So I went back to work the day after my fight, and then I was back on training on Tuesday. Um, I went back to the gym and just uh, tried to sweat out everything that I had in Japan. <laughs> Well, let me let me ask you this: What keeps you from overtraining? I, I know you, you know a little bit personally to seen this training, and I mean, I'm seeing you train until you're throwing up multiple times. <laughs> what what, yeah. keeps you, what keeps you from overtraining? Do you have a coach, somebody that pulls man, I, trains back? I used to think there was such a thing as overtraining, but man, to be honest, I I don't think there is a thing in overtraining like that. Uh, I think if you re recover and rest in the evening and um, take care of yourself, um, it's kind of hard to overtrain. And uh, most especially, um, there's a guy I've been watching lately, um, and I, I listen to his stuff a lot, um, David Goggins. Uh -huh. um, every time I t think, like, oh, shit, my body is, like, yeah. going down, maybe I'm overtraining, I, and I see stuff that um, – I also listen to his audio books – and I hear the stuff that he's been through with, like, uh, his Navy SEAL training, uh, Ranger training. It's like, man, is there – like, I just don't think it's possible to overtrain. It's more of a mental thing, you know? Yeah, um, I hear you. But, yeah, it's a, it's a mental barrier you have to break. Um, and I think, uh, you know, right now I just – I don't – Feel that there's such a thing as overtraining, honestly. Well, and that's that's a good mentality I have. I felt like sometimes that's a pre-built-in excuse for fighters: is oh, yeah. well, I didn't peak, I overtrained, I had an adrenaline dump because I put in too much work in the gym. I, you know, but I just feel like you know that's why a lot of fighters don't want to go a long period of time without fighting. And, yeah. Well, of course, I mean that you fought March 9th, you're going to fight again June 2nd. That's that's not bad. How many fights would you prefer a year? I mean, I, I know you, but... Man, I mean, ideally, if I could, I'd fight, like, every one or two months. But, of course, um, you know, you have to consider after fights. Like, for me, my common thing after fights is my hands are always um, not busted up or broken, but they're always pretty sore and swollen. Mm -hmm. um, it takes maybe a couple weeks, two to three weeks, just for the swelling and stuff to go down to where I can hit comfortably in training again, you know, so... You have to give that into consideration, and it happens to me almost every fight. So um, I want to say, like, for me, if I could, ideally, every three to four months have a fight. That's perfect. I think that would be perfect, you know. As far as your hands go, you've never broken either one of your hands? Uh, yes, I have. Actually, I shattered my right hand in my second fight in Japan. Um, 
yeah, I was in the middle of the fight and I, I don't even know exactly how it broke, but I just remember, um, I kept trying to grab the guy and every time I would grab him, it was hard to close my hand. And when it finally did close it, like shut. And then it was like stuck. Oh, so stuck. And when I try to open it back up, it would open and then it would just pop open. Like it, I, right away, I knew something was wrong. And you can even see me in the fight. Like one time I was on top. I was trying to adjust my like uh, my thumb and stuff, you know. So uh, I've broken my hand in, in a fight before. I uh, probably. But, but you don't time. think you don't think the swelling has anything to do with that, though, huh? It's just you hit like a truck or what? Uh oh, you mean uh, now? Yeah, no, I I think it's just uh, it's just bound to happen, man. With those four ounce gloves, I mean, even the best tape jobs, you know, um, boxers hurt their hands pretty often, and they're using you know what, eight to 10 ounce gloves and yep. their, their wraps are definitely way more sturdy than MMA wraps. So um, I just think it's bound to happen in, um, in uh, especially in MMA fights with those small gloves. How much, uh, how much wrap do you do? Because I know in MMA aren't some of the rules that you just have to wrap like once or twice? Uh, yeah, so it's funny as my deep fight, they were really strict on the wrapping. I couldn't even, they couldn't even tape on my thumb. Oh. Um, the only thing that was allowed on the thumb was the gauze, and then also on your hand part, you can't go like towards the knuckle with tape. It just could only be gauze. So, Why is uh, that? Do you know? Uh man, I don't know. I just it's like um, to me, it's not like you're cheating or anything. If it secures your hand, I mean, you would think right the safety of the fighters from them getting injured, you allow them to tape it pretty securely. But I don't know why that is. Yeah, that's that's strange. Have you uh, have you watched any of that bare knuckle fighting that they've been doing? Of course, Paulie Milanaji's fighting. Um, I've, I've seen highlights. I haven't really watched like full fight cards. I think some of their wraps, that the way they wrap is is causing some of the cuts rather than actual you know knuckles causing the cuts. It seems like the wraps, like gloves do, sliding across the the face is what's causing some of the cuts. And maybe it has oh, yeah. something to do with that. I don't, I don't know. I, but I've never heard of that because isn't the thumb being wrapped a pretty big deal to you? Um, man, for me, I always like to wrap my th uh, thumbs because, like I said, my hands always get busted up and my thumbs will too, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and when I did have the surgery on my hand, uh, my thumb part was actually the one that needed a few pins and screws in there. So, yeah. so, so you just don't hit the bag for a few weeks probably or pads or anything? Uh, yeah, I hit the bag, bag and pads, but I make sure I wrap pretty good with the, like, you know, legit boxing style wraps, uh, mm -hmm. hand wraps. Um, like that one, it's pretty secure and, you know. And then the, and then the swelling just goes down after a few weeks. Do you do any ice, anything like that? Yeah, I, I use ice a lot. Um, hot, hot, uh, what's that? Hot cold therapy helps oh, yeah. me a lot. That's what's up. And so you didn't even get to stay in Japan long enough to party or anything, huh? You, you're in and out. Like yeah, of, man. I got. I was only on a few days of leave for work, so. <laughs> yeah, right, right. How how much before did you get there? Only like forty eight hours or less. I think we flew in on a. I think I fought on a Saturday. We flew in on Thursday, the day before the weigh in. And and but, do they they fly in you and one other person or? Yeah, they flew in a corner man, and then uh, I had a sponsor take care of another corner man. Oh, cool, cool. That's, that's nice. Because I know, like, Victor Henry only could fly in Josh Barnett with him, and then they had to have me, Yamaguchi, who's there in Japan already, because that's the only people they would fly in, you know? I wondered about that, not, not having your full corner. Um, well, let's move on to uh, the big announcement, of course, June 2nd in Kobe. Have you ever yeah. been to Kobe, first of all? Um, no, I haven't. I've been to Osaka though, which from what I've heard is pretty close. Okay. Um, yeah, I went to Osaka, um, at least a couple of times. I know I went for, um, one of my good friends fought in the deep versus Pancras Osaka. Mm -hmm. And also I went out a uh, family vacation to Universal Studios in Osaka too. Wow. Before we it's get nice to what, what's that? I'm sorry. No, it's a nice area down there. I like it. It's more, um, it's less, uh, what you would call that, less busy than uh, Tokyo. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tokyo seems seems like New York City or something. Just chaos everywhere. Yep. 
Uh, so before we get into that fight, I uh, recently saw your Facebook post. Do you want to tell the story about how you ran into a, what was it, a high school or a middle school friend? Oh, yeah, yeah, man. Um, it's just crazy, like, just thinking about how, what were the chances of it happening because, well, first we went to school, like, all the way in Washington State, and then, um, yeah, this guy had the, I was crossing the street, and he kept just, like, honking at me, and, um, you know, I just thought, like, hey, man, somebody, I, you know, like, people, it's pretty often when I walk across the street, and, you know, somebody I'll know just honk, or, and he just kept on, kept on, and then I was like, dude, what's up with this guy, you know? And, you know, we went to high school together, and I, I just kept thinking, I was like, man, maybe he means middle school, because I didn't go to high school out here. And, like, when I looked really close and I recognized him, I was like, oh, shit. And then, you know, he pulled over and uh, he talked it up a little bit. And then I invited over over to my house the uh, following day to um, just had a small barbecue. And he actually, he lives in Japan now. And he he, uh, he was actually telling me that he saw one of my fights on, on TV when he was at a ramen. He was eating ram, uh, ramen. And I was like, oh, shit, that's pretty cool, man. So I had a whole up with him up there in northern Japan. How long had it been since you've seen this guy? Since high school? Since high school, yeah. And so that's so, uh, 15 years ago. Did you, even, did you recognize him? I mean... Yeah, oh, I had to look close. And when I finally realized, I was like, wow, man, that's crazy. Like, <laughs> that's wild, man. You know, like, right? like, just the, the odds for me to walk out of my work at the time he was at the traffic light. Like, that's just... Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Did he know that you were in Guam? Yeah, he knew I was in Guam, and then when I saw him, he was telling me, he was like, he's like, man, I, w- I was hoping I'd run into you here, and I was like, man, that's a, I mean, I know Guam's small, but still, there's still almost a couple hundred thousand people, you know? Like, yeah, that's still a huge yeah. chance to take. I mean, that's like Colorado Springs here, you know, has a few hundred yeah. thousand people. I wouldn't just tell somebody, hey, maybe I'll run into you, because it ain't going to happen, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, that's wild. So he lives in northern Japan. Uh, what, where, whereabouts is that? Have you been up there? Uh, I think he said he was by the Misawa area, and I've I've never been that far north to Japan. Uh, but he was telling me like the snow and snowboarding up there is pretty cool. So, oh man, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll take a family trip up there sometime and uh, come visit and snowboard. Yeah. yeah, hell yeah, bro. So you get the call. Um, how much, if you care to give some insight, how uh, how much notice did you know before the press conference that you had gotten this fight? Um, it was confirmed the day before the press conference. Wow. Uh, there was talks that I was going to be on that June 2nd card, uh, but nothing set, you know, and my thing is always just either way, I'm just training. Ready to uh, go. Like for me, like I could fight, I, the way I train, I could fight in a couple of days with just, you know, a couple of days notice because I mean, I'm always ready, you know, that's just yeah. how I want. No, I know from watching. So for you, me, like, four, four weeks for me is a uh, pretty good, amount of notice so <laughs> some people are like oh that's pretty short notice but not for me man that's a good amount of time <laughs> yeah yeah for anyone that knows you you're in the gym like crazy and uh you know your your team i i think that has a lot to do with it the spike 22 gym you guys just seems like you have a real tight knit good system there that's keeping everyone in shape all the time yeah, yeah. you know i mean yeah. cause i assume it's the same for me yamamoto who gets the same amount of notice and she's ready to go you know yeah she's uh yeah she's always training too man like a- and I think that's the thing that separates, you know, a lot of people is if you're just in the gym all the time, like you don't need to get ready, man. You should be ready all the time. What, what do you think about that fight? I mean, I know you're biased, of course, but uh, Kana Sakura is a hell of a fighter, as you know. Um, what do you think the key to that fight is? If you if you had to point out one thing, um, man, the that's a like I was saying, that's a super good matchup, like. Um, of course, I'm a fan of both, and uh, you know, Miu is part of the team, mm-hmm. and uh, definitely rooting for Miu. And that's, yeah, that's like, I wish, or I'm hoping, I think I have enough time, hopefully, before my fight to finish so I can catch that fight, you know. And uh, I think, man, if Miu just fights what she's to what she's capable of, she should she should be able to take the win, you know, and uh, be a good win for her for sure. Because, oh uh, well, man. That's a former champion, you know. I think that that win puts her right up there, if not a title shot next, then somebody right there because uh, Hamasaki just won the title from Asakura. I mean, there's not very many girls there in between, you know, that I, I would nominate at least. And I'm so, thinking, yeah, I'm thinking it could be a title eliminator, you know. Man, that's – and I like both girls so much, too. I'm partial and biased, of course, towards me. I, you know, know her a little bit personally. She's an awesome fucking person. 
And, uh, but I like Kana Asakura a lot. I like the way she fights. I yeah. like, how, I mean, look at what she did to Reyna in both those fights. Reyna went and trained our takedown defense for months and months and still couldn't stop the girl, you know? Yeah. And, and then you got Hamazaki, who to me is the best in the world. I've been yeah, dude, I'm hanging that drum, you know? And I don't yeah. know the girl or anything at all, but I know that while she was in Invicta, the USA media was basically, you know, oh, yeah, this is the best in the world. And it's kind of like people forgot about her for some reason. Yeah. I'm like, hey, yeah. she's still the best in the world. She's just yeah. people somewhere else, you know? Yep. Did you get a chance to catch that uh, Invicta one-night tournament? Uh, no, I actually didn't. Uh, but is that the one she won? No, no, that was just the one that was on this past weekend. It was that Phoenix oh, Rising. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't get to catch that one then. Yeah, the, the only problem is our rules here in the U.S., and I don't know what it's like in Guam, but, of course, in the U.S., we can only fight five rounds in one night, right? And so so the first two fights were only one-round fights. And, oh, I see, yeah. And that's tough for me. And even as a, as a watcher, it's like, eh, so, some of these fights I wanted to see go one more round at least, you know? Yeah, it's hard to have a to really determine, you know, um, a clear cut winner with only one round. Yeah, yeah, and that you know, unless you're a dude who just wants to knock the guy out in thirty seconds. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so let's get to this to this fight, JQ. And how much do you know about him? Um, man, not too much. Um, seems like a guy who's just kind of fought in multiple organizations, so. Uh, you know, he definitely has a good amount of experience. Um, we were on the same card when he fought uh, Yuri Prohaska. Mm -hmm. um, he seems pretty decent all around. Um, I think it's a good fight for me, man. You know, he's, yeah, like I said, he's he's, he's decent every all around. And to me, it doesn't look, look like he has too much of a weakness anywhere in any specific part of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited for this matchup. It uh, looks yeah. like he's down to trade, too, so... You know, I'm always looking for for that type of opponent. <laughs> I'm hoping so. You know, from watching that Yuri fight, I believe that was contracted at 205 pounds. Um, and he, he, I don't know what, what he's going to come in on this fight, but I know that he seems like a bigger guy that probably had to cut some weight for that fight. Plus, uh -huh. Yuri is one of the best in the world, too. It's hard to gauge from just that. But uh, yeah. I, do, I do think as well that it's going to be a, he's going to want to stand with you. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I hope so. Right, that that was Ryzen thirteen that you guys were on the same card. So you actually got to watch his fight. Do you remember that? Um, no, you know I didn't because we, she, we had to leave early to catch the trains before that typhoon hit. So I was out of there. Already. I didn't get to catch it. So, so if if a fight's what well, you were saying that you hope to see me this fight, if it's right before yours, you're probably not watching it. Basically, uh man, unless I could have, unless they have the, sometimes they have the screens right there in the back where you're warming up. Um, I probably catch it that way if 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 I if she was before me, right? But I'm, I'm I I'm pretty sure she's gonna be like probably either the co-main event or something. So right. I should be able to catch hers. And one question I keep getting from fans is, how much of your own tape do you watch? Um, uh, to be honest, it, it depends. Like, there's some fights like afterwards I'll really wanna see like what I'm doing and kind of make adjustments from there. Um, there's some fights that I I didn't really care too much to watch or, you know, whatever. But, uh, man, I, I would say I, I watch my, my own fights pretty frequently or I'll randomly be, like, YouTubing fights and I'll be like, oh, I want to see this fight from this year or whatever, you know. So, right. And what about your opponent's fights? Have you studied any JQ film? Uh, just a little bit. I've never been too big on watching – too much, too much footage because uh, anything can change in the in the in the actual fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just like to see what they're they like to throw a lot or if they have a habit of doing certain things. But to just look at previous fights and say, oh, they're gonna do this, so I should do that. To me, is like, uh, I don't. What if he doesn't do that? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You go in there a lot of times expecting someone to do something. You might get caught waiting. You know. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to get caught in that. So I look at it more as I want to do what I'm capable of doing. I want to be the one to make him do certain things, you know, as opposed oh, yeah. to what is he doing when I do that. What, I think uh, it's just a way of looking at it.
what was your reaction when you heard the president Sakuraba call you a mainstay of the heavyweight division? Uh, man, I felt good. You know, I just like for me, I was in a bit of like I was trying to figure out. You know, like, and are they gonna want to push me or, you know, am I am I just one of those guys to fill the card? Uh, but to be honest, man, I man, I love Japan. Um, I love fighting there. You know, I'd like to be like you know. Man, they could throw me on every card if they want, and you know I'll do my best to put on a uh, a good show. And so you know, I, uh, it, was, it was humbling hearing him say that. And uh, hopefully, you know, after this performance, you know, get more fights lined up and get a you know like maybe a good contract going. Or oh yeah, well you know, and the fans that's what they've been asking for, especially over the past the past few shows, is where are the heavyweight fights. We want yeah. heavyweight fights, you know, even people even want, they even say, hey, even if they're the freak show fights where guy's 180 yeah. pounds and the other guy's 250, so let's get something. You know, yeah. that is the staple of pride too, you know what I mean? It's Minowa man taking on the, the heavyweights and things like that. And so, uh, but I believe there's enough good heavyweights out there. I mean, with Road FC and Real, F, Real FC and, you know, yeah. some organizations, Bellator, uh, I mean, this is this cross promotion with Bellator. I would love to see, sort of like what they just did with their heavyweight tournament, but with Ryzen. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I just think that I imagine a matchup with you and Ryan Bader as being a, a hell of a matchup because your takedown yeah. defense is good, and you know, you're probably a little bit longer than he is as well. Have you have you watched much of his fighting? Um, not too much. I've seen maybe his last couple, like against Fedor. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, not too much on him, man. Uh, I know he's a he's a pretty damn good fighter, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, and he may I don't I don't know what's gonna happen, but he may go back to light heavyweight and and vacate that heavyweight title. We just don't know. But uh, with the cross promotion, I mean, you got Nemkov, you got a lot of fighters there in Bellator. I mean, I, I just think that you know you can be the face of this heavyweight division and. You know, I mean, not too much pressure to put on you, of course, but uh, it's, uh, like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big fight for you, bro. I mean, you know, it just yeah. really is. It's a big fight for Ryzen's heavyweight division, you know? Yeah, for me, I, I'm looking at it as a really big fight because it's actually my um, – this will be my last fight on my uh, part of this small contract with Ryzen. Uh, it was only a two-fight two contract. As mm -hmm. a, you know, I had my first two fights on a contract, then this is the last part of my second fight con uh, two-fight contract, so – for me, it's like, um, man, if, you know, I really, I really got to put on a good performance and show that, you know, I want to get, get what I'm worth and also show that, yeah, I just want to fight a lot, you know. So, yeah, is that pretty typical? I mean, most people I've talked to seem like they're on a two fight rising contract. Um, I would, I think so. That's about their standard, but um. But then they have the certain guys that that are probably the like like we talked about the mainstays, the Asakura brothers, people like this, you know. Yeah, um, they're probably locked in for multiple fights, you know. And, I mean, that's something like if you're going to lock me in for multiple fights, and that that would kind of give me uh, reassurance that I'm probably going to get you know a good amount of fights and be active. So, I mean, if that's what it takes, and you know the pay is good, then and I'm all for it. You know, I just. And once again, I feel like you, you hold that key, bro. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's, all, it's all on me. And I always tell myself that, like, I can't, if I don't perform this fight, like I can't complain if I don't get a good contract, you know what I mean? So I'm 100% aware that pretty much this could be my, my uh, feature in fighting, you know, this what? next fight, like everything I do here can determine whether I'm going to move up or move down, man. And, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's why I hate even saying anything like that because, you know, to me as a fan and just looking at the scope of the division, it is a fight to where it's like, hey, if you don't perform or look too good or something, it's it's a setback. And then you, need, you know how it is. You've had setbacks in your life. You need a few more fights to just get back to where you are right now, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely. It's like then you kind of feel like, damn, I've been working towards this, you know? And so I hate even mentioning it because then I feel like I'm putting pressure on people. But, hey, you know, you're the fighter. Yeah, I don't mind pressure, man. Like, I've growing up competing all my life. Like, to me, it's just pressure. Like, I think it brings out the best of me. And I, and I, and I like it, man. And, you know, I just – I'm just excited because, like, really, like, I mean, 
it's a lot of people they're like jq versus roki martinez that ah, could be a good fight it's not a big fight in their eyes but for me it's like to me it's like everything comes together and this could be my future like i said earlier you know and, and for me that i was looking at my crocop fight that was the one for me that was like hey here's my chance to prove i belong with the best in the world and of course i lost that one you know and um like you said there was a setback and my following fight after that was against Rio Sakai, who I, I, I mean, no offense to him at all. He's a great fighter, but I felt like I didn't, he didn't deserve to be in there with me, you know? So, right. right. But then again, like I lost my fight prior to that. So that was all on me, you know? Well, and it was on you, but you also, as you know, <laughs> the, yeah, the sport's so damn unlucky sometimes that you could just sustain a cut because I rewatched that bout multiple times and, and really, you know, putting people onto your fights, I'm telling them to go watch that fight. I mean, in my assessment, it was an even fight. There yeah. was, you know, I mean, you you had some good shots landed on him. He turned you a couple times in the corner, the crow cop that is, and you turned him a couple times in the corner. And what what was uh what was the feelings and emotions like when he had to retire for you? Because surely you wanted the rematch. Yeah, yeah, for sure, I wanted the rematch, but at the same time, like, um, you know, like I. I I was a big fan of his as well. And I, you don't ever want to see a guy to suffer like that, you know, and uh, I'm just glad he's still okay. And he can retire happily from what I've heard. He's, he'll be okay. You know, he's, but he can't fight of course, but yeah. Yeah. No, he's back to training and doing what he does. And he, you know, I think as long as he stays in the gym, it'll be good. But to a fan like me, it was a, it's sad. It was like the end of an era, you know, yeah. it was yeah, like, you know, it was, it was like you you losing the Supersonics or when Kobe retired for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah, the era ended. But, uh, you know, he went out on a high note. I mean. Yeah, if, for sure. Freak. What was that, 10-fight winning streak? Yeah, yeah. If you could go out on a 10-fight win streak, bro. That's a good way to go out. <laughs> fucking A, bro. And, and then going to another promotion and beating Roy Nelson and, you know. And I, I just didn't like some of the comments that were made by Roy Nelson. Did you hear any of that? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, he really just, uh, uh, you, you'd have to read it. I probably wouldn't do any justice. So I'll send you some articles. But uh, And I, I'm usually a fan of Roy. You know, I enjoy watching him fight. But he just had a lot of negative things to say about Crow Cop and uh, was worried about the testing and all that. Oh, okay. So uh, so when will you fly out to Japan? Um, Usually I fly out. We fight on a Sunday. I think I usually fly out on a Thursday. So I get there the day before like our media day. So our media day is usually on Friday and then um, we have our media day and then the weigh in the following day is Saturday. And is this weigh in or uh, is it uh, contracted to where you have to be a certain weight or I mean, do you? Uh, I just have to come on under 265 uh, pounds, 120 kilos. Okay. Oh, can you hold on one sec? Sorry. Yeah, you no, take problem, no problem. No problem, bro. Uh, take uh, Mike, you check the door. You check the door. Oh, hold on. I'll get it. No problem, no problem at all, Rookie. You check the door. Someone's knocking. Somebody's knocking. Don't let him in, bro. You might have to knock him out. What is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> what is that? Okay. All right, we're good. Good. My daughter's friend had to drop off her uh, one of her. Um, or watch or something. <laughs> I was going to make you turn the camera if you had to knock anybody out. <laughs> <laughs> luckily not, luckily not. And, and so you'll get there on a Thursday, a um, little bit more time to prepare. Um, media day on Friday, weigh-ins. Uh, what do they do with people that are above 265? Because I know that used to happen. And I mean... I think they just make that like an open weight, uh, okay. open, weight, uh, open weight class. Uh, but yeah, as far as I know, this one's just at 120 kilos, which is, I'm under that. Like right now I'm sitting at about, uh, two or 115 or 114 kilos. Oh, geez. So you're, you're quite a ways under. Yeah. So I get to do the usual buffet before the weigh in. <laughs> oh yeah. Have you ever had a problem making the 265? No, I, I haven't. Um, the one time I did have to cut was, uh, or recently was against Crow Cop. We had to, they put a, I forgot how many kilos, but the weight was, I was supposed to come in under 241, I think. Mm -hmm. It was a weird uh, random number. Just so there wasn't so much difference in between you and him though, right? 
I actually came in lighter than he did. I was 239. He was like 240, 241. I was like, yeah. Oh, see, I thought maybe it was the, I think it's what, like a 10 kilo thing to where if you're that far apart from each other, then you, you know, there's different rules with the elbows and things like that, I think. Yeah, no, I just, it was weird. Um, but he weighed more than you, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they thought I was bigger than what I was. I don't know. That's just a weird number to throw out, though, to me. That is weird. Uh, I you, hey, man, I just wanted to fight him. I would have went down even more if you wanted. <laughs> I hear you, man. And that was a rematch we all wanted to see. But, of course, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I would have loved to see him just have a retirement fight and know it's his last. But to be honest with you, I don't know if Crow Cop would have ever retired. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that guy didn't want to stop. Yeah, because what he was supposed to retire already like two or three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I, when it comes to that point in your career, Roki, and it's like, what if you like him get better? You lose a couple in the UFC like he did, but then you you all of a sudden get better and you're on a three four fight win streak. But you're forty years old. You know we've we've talked about retirement before, but you know isn't that going to be a hard thing to balance? Yeah, I mean, I know it's going to be tough, but at the same time, I think I'll I'll be pretty smart about it as well, you know. But I mean, would you see yourself wanting to go out on a win? Would that be yeah. ideally? I'd want to retire on a win, for sure. Yeah, see, from so I could never. If I, if I could retire on the 10, 10 fight win streak like Krokop did, that, I mean, that's a good way to hang it up, you know. It, Okay, man. That's a really good way to hang it up. <laughs> okay, well, we talked about the cut last time, but watching the confession series, they showed a little bit more of how uh, frustrated you were not only leaving the ring but backstage. I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember that. Uh, what, what was that emotion like? And um, we didn't really talk about that last time, but uh, were were you angry like it looked? Uh man, yeah, I was angry, but. At the same time, like I was saying earlier, to me, that fight was my fight to show the world, like, you know, I can compete with the best. And I had all these envisions after that I was going to beat them and then, you know, get some serious good fights and, you know, be like a star, you know, like. Mm -hmm. But after losing that, right when I had that that loss, it just hit me that, man, I, I lost, you know, like that, there went that whole vision of. And um, I mean, on top of that, I'm a super competitive guy. I hate losing, man. Yeah. So it was combined with losing. Um, he also snapped a streak of mine, an unbeaten streak of. I think I was I was on a nine fight unbeaten streak because we were like I I had a draw somewhere in there, but as far as somebody beating me, I haven't lost in nine fights. So I, I that was snapped. You know, um, my vision of being that star, that step up to that next level was snapped. Just a lot of things, man. And when you when you really the amount of work I know I put in and energy and everything is just to end it that way i think was the harder part i, I probably would have i would have more closure if i got like knocked out you know like okay, i was gonna say would you have rather went out on your back than you know yeah, exactly I, if i was knocked out or he tko'd me or submitted me or whatever like that's that's something i can you know i can live with like but man for it to be snapped with a with a cut was the harder part did you happen to catch the Alima Le McFarlane and uh, Vita Ortega fight a couple weeks ago in uh, No, I didn't get to catch that either. Girl had that cut that you could see her skull. Uh -huh. uh, it was bad. It was worse than yours. I mean, about probably the same length. But, uh -huh. uh, you know, I really felt for her and thought about you at that time because it's like she wanted to continue. Uh, yeah. Alima Le was asking the ref, isn't there any way we could both sign something? But... You know, as you know, there's there's muscles and nerves and shit in that part of your head that you just can't uh, can't be yeah. around. You know what I mean? So so looking back, I'm sure that they did it for because Ryzen's not uh, you know in Japan in general is not very notorious for stopping fights very easily. You know, I mean, you think yeah. about think I've about seen. the Vandalay Silva highlights where he continuously stomped on a guy's head. You know? Yep. But. That's uh, so, so that cut, uh, I asked you this last time, but it hasn't, uh, you haven't had any reopenings, nothing in that area. Uh, yeah, no issues with it at all. That's, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So what, so what do you expect, uh, Jake to come in at? Do you have any clue? I mean, what, what are you, what are you looking at? Man, I'm not sure. Um, it's a has he competed at heavyweight before? Um, yeah, I think he has. Um, I looked on his record. He's had a few heavyweight fights. I think his last two were at heavyweight. Um, yeah, yeah, you know what? He fought uh, Mike Favell at uh, Alaska FC, 
and that was a heavyweight 265, 120 kilogram, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to have to look at that tape and see because I don't remember that fight. Um, I just wanted to see what he looked like because watching the Yuri Prochaska fight seemed to me like he is a natural heavyweight, you know? I mean, he seems like he's probably about 220, 225 at least, you know? Yeah. Yeah, probably, I would guess, probably around and, that. And so you were thinking you're probably coming in about 240, something like that? Yeah, I'm like, I'll probably be around 240, 240-ish. Do you, uh, you've gone up and down, uh, do you feel better or heavier, lighter? Is there any preference? Um, so far, I feel like I feel better, like, being a little bit lighter, like around my two, uh, 230s, 240s. Uh, when I fought Krokop, I was 239, I felt, I felt really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's an ideal weight for me to fight at. Um, What's the heaviest you fought at? Um, pretty close to 265. This was, um, one of my title defenses in, uh, in the PXC in the Philippines. Oh, okay. I was like, five, yeah. All right. Well, we're all looking forward to it, Rocky. And, uh, let me give you a couple fan questions and then I'm going to let you go. Um, okay. And we're, we're, hopefully we'll catch up after the fight and we'll talk about uh, the, the beautiful, bright future that you're going to have, right? Yeah. yeah All, right. Right. All right. One of the fans wants to know if you could choose a fighting organization, um, regardless of pay, say they all paid the same, would you prefer UFC, Bellator, or Ryzen? Um, it's tough, man. Um. You know, like I said, man, I, I really like the way Ryzen is with me because my my history with watching, like, Pride and Japan MMA in general, um, and also the fact that it's so close to home, man, and, you know, yeah. it's just hop a flight over and compete and come right back. Um, you know, at the same time, too, you know, UFC, they, they also, they have, you know, a lot of the best competitors there, and it's pretty watched. So, but, man, like, I always look back and I think if Ryzen can get pretty close to how its pride days were, like there's, there's nothing that can beat that pride nostalgia, you know? So I don't know, man. I mean, if, like I said, Ryzen could definitely be that, be that, you know, next one, maybe not quite the same, but that nostalgia is there. And I I love Japan. To me, I think that they're already partway there having, you know, Horiguchi, who I've long argued is the best in the world. I mean, the only two guys that have a chance against him in the world is probably Henry Cejudo and and, and, uh, Demetrius Johnson, right? Yeah, yeah, man. He's he's up there and he's leading the way for Ryzen, you know, showing that, you know, they, they could have the best competitors in the world. Man, and I, you know, I don't know if people know that story. I I don't know how well you know Horiguchi, but he turned down quite a bit of money from the uh-huh. UFC to, to yeah. go start for an organization that had just started just because he believed in them. So a lot of what you're saying about how Ryzen believes in you, I, I think you believe in, in them back and us fans, same thing. Ideal scenario, Roki, would be if the UFC would just come to the table like Bellator has and let's just let the best fight the best. God yeah, damn. Well, that'd be so cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what all us fans want to see. It's what I get asked all the time is, do I ever think the UFC will do it? And after the Chuck Liddell thing, I just don't see Dana White swallowing his ego to let let one of his champions go over there again, you know? Yeah. That would be <laughs> ideal, though, man. <laughs> but I think – I also think with KSW in the mix and, and, like I said, Real FC and some of these other promotions, Bellator, of course, they also have some of the top talent in the world. And so – if all these other organizations just band together like like the president wants, yeah, in a tournament style, then hey, you know what? Forget the UFC. Then you're considered the best in the world because it's not your fault they don't want to step to the table. You know? Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, also, uh, I think I asked you about music last time. Are you changing your walkout song this time? You decided on that? Yeah, probably not because I actually get messages now. Um from the Japanese fans or one guy was apparently he was saying that uh uh me was the one who translated it she's she uh, replied back to what the guy said um and she said he was saying something I can't wait to dance to my to my song so I was like hey man shit, if, they, if they're starting to like it too you know and yeah well and it, and it becomes a it becomes a staple I've talked to like Shinju and a couple other people that want to change their song just based on how they're feeling but they have to understand that even fans like me, it's like 
shit, I'm still bumping uh, Fabulous Is My Time. And that song was you know, eight years old, but it's just because it's Horaguchi's song, you know? Yeah. You hear that, and you know Kyoji's about to come out. Oh, uh, you know what's the funny part about that? That His song is I've actually used that song back in 2000. I'm pretty sure I used it before he did. For real? Uh, it was in a deep fight, too, 2009. 2009. You, you remember what deep event that was? Uh, it was the one I got leg locked in. <laughs> Oh shit! Oh shit! Uh, I so, guess it wasn't my time. That was the Achilles <laughs> lock. That was the the Tazawa fight. Yeah, Tazawa. Yeah, and I'm gonna that's have to also go. when I shattered my hand too. Oh fuck! I'm gonna have to go not back. Yet, to that's interesting because he's been using that song, like you said, probably not quite that long, but I believe at the end of his UFC run is when he started using it. Because that song's about that old, right? It's about eight or nine years old. Yep. So yeah, I used to use that song, but my my song now, man, I just um just kind of puts me in like this happy rhythm and and what uh, is the, what is the name and the artist of that song for people who want to know? Um, it's five more hours. Um, uh, it's actually originally by Dioro, but it's mixed with the uh, the one I use is with Chris Brown. Um, and the reason with that song that I really like it is I used it in my after my last retirement, temporary retirement. I used that song on my deep title fight the comeback fight and it just has a part in there that kind of says like i can't i can't stay away uh it's just my kind of party and uh you know i just felt like at that time like shit, it could i couldn't stay away and this is definitely my type of party <laughs> that was that was after you had the major injuries to your legs right your your ankle uh, oh no this was actually the this was in 2016 when i came back and fought in 2017 oh okay okay See, and you'd be on the sidelines watching all this right now. And, you know, so it's a good thing you did come back because I told you last time, the heavyweights don't get in their prime until, you know, around your age. I mean, yeah, that's how I feel, man. I feel like I'm, feel like I'm not even there yet, but I'm getting there. You know, yeah. And so training's been good. Everything's been good there, huh? Yeah, everything's good, man. Everything's been good. Who, who will be in your corner this time, Rookie? Um, right now, as that I have confirmed, um, with my two passes is uh, Melker Manabusen, who's the head coach at Spike 22, and then uh, my manager, Tone Bashaw, will okay. be there. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other Guam people flying out, so uh, I think we can have up to three people come out with you, something like that. So maybe one other person will be in. How long is the flight? Uh, on average to Tokyo is three hours, like a little over three hours, but we're just going to Osaka, which I think is pretty close to the same time. And then we just, I'm guessing we'll catch the uh, train down to Kobe. That's close. And is there any elevation difference? What, what are you at at Guam? Sea level? Uh, I believe we're right about sea level. Okay. Uh, and I, don't, okay. I, don't think, yeah, it's a, I don't think there's a difference there. Oh, that's, geez, that's close. That's, I mean, you know, that's me flying just across the states, basically, you know, yeah. not even. Well, uh, we want to thank you, Rocky, and we're looking forward to it. June 2nd, Ryzen 16. Uh, we can't wait to hear the bout order. I'm hoping, uh, you know, I mean, regardless of where you are on the bout, actually, I did want to ask you this. Have Have you ever wanted to be first on the Ryzen card? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind being first and opening up, you know, with a good show, get the crowd excited. So they can put me on there first if they want. Don't okay. matter to me, man. I'll, I'll put on a show during intermission if they want to. <laughs> uh, you know, for fans that don't understand, being first at a Japanese event is actually a pretty prestigious honor, right? Yeah, you're the, the, the open tone for the, for the rest of the event. Um, yep. But, but you know, I just, I just hope that this kicks off something big in the heavyweight division, I think, with the fans pushing for it, that it really will, because that's the one thing that I feel like Ryzen's lacked so far. I mean, yep. now that we have a light heavyweight title, you know, we're going to have some tournaments. They're going to be sending some people hopefully over for the, the Bellator tournament, you know, the flyweights or whatever it is. Um, Horiguchi coming over for the for the Caldwell fight. Uh, you know, that's that's going to be great. Uh, I, was oh, hoping, yeah. I was hoping they would send Lenny Hart out here because I'll fly out there if she's there. You know what I mean? yeah. uh, that's going to be a cool one, too. Fucking A, bro. But we will catch up after the fight, hopefully, man. And uh, good luck to you. Uh, good health and everything, safe travels, and we'll be talking, brother. Thank you so much for doing right. this, man. And uh, right on, brother, and fucking good luck at Rising 16, June 2nd. Everyone go follow Rocky Martinez, uh, Rocky underscore 86. Yep. 
Uh, Roki Mar- uh, Roki underscore Martinez 86. Yeah. All right. Well, go follow him. I'll tweet all this out. It'll be in the description of the video. And uh, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks again. You have a good one, too. Right. Try to get some rest, bro. All right. Thanks. All right, everybody. Welcome to today. today's podcast, a very special one. Uh, we have the one and only, the very unique, and who I consider to be the best talent in sports, uh, not even combat sports, but the best announcer in sports history, uh, Miss Lenny Hart. Lenny, how are you? Oh, well, very flattered, and I'm blushing a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is how are you, Zach? I'm doing good. That is only the truth. I've been a fan of yours, geez, since since before I can remember. I'm 35 now, so it's uh, it's been been quite a ride for me. Um, Thank you. Let me just start up here at the top. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but uh, how did you get in? How did you develop this talent, Lanny? What, what did you? I mean, it's so unique. But when did you realize that you had this vocal range talent? I guess probably, you know, I've, I've sort of always known it. My mother was deaf. And uh, as a kid growing up, it was very important that you know, I enunciate well and express myself creatively so that she could understand. We didn't have sign language. She didn't, for some reason, never wanted us to learn sign language. She never learned it herself. So, uh, yeah, being expressive and being able to have control over my voice and not actually just shout which wouldn't have helped her, right? <laughs> um, she could hear, she could hear, but she couldn't, she was she was legally deaf. She was completely deaf in one ear and could only hear one quarter as well as uh, the average person in her other ear. So she could actually hear my voice, but only if it was the right pitch, the right tone, the right volume. And then of course, if she wanted to get any of the nuances, there had to be some little bit of character, a little bit of timber and, you know, uh, Mm-hmm. And a little character, definitely. I mean, I would actually, I would actually do voices for her. <laughs> oh, and what age was this? I'm sorry, say again. What age was this? Oh, all my life. My mother was deaf all my life. I'm, I'm the youngest of six kids. She wasn't always deaf. She, um, she was deaf all of my life. But my brothers and sisters knew her when she wasn't. And uh, um, so, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, there, actually, there's a related thing I was going to say about that is the generational gap, too. There was a huge generation gap between us, right? So mm-hmm. uh, for her to be able to understand even even things like, you know, I, uh, my mother and father were 40 and 41 when I was born. So, oh, uh, wow. that, you know, you, you had to try to express things like, I mean, it's the 1970s, and I'm talking to a woman who was born in 1922, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, you had to be kind of expressive to, to, to explain the world around her that was so different from what, you know, she had grown up with. Jeez, that's 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 unbelievable, and and so I think that uh, may have had a lot to do with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. That sense may have a lot to do with uh, just how you learn to communicate. I'm sure as well, huh? Yeah, how I learned to think too. I'm sure. Yeah, Jeez, language that, does that too. I, mean, I speak Japanese, and I realized the, the way I my my thinking was a lot more open and uh, and. Um, accepting i think when uh, wow. when i learned a second language so it was kind of a third language because i had you know we had our own little sort of household mm-hmm. language for my mother next question is how, when did you learn japanese um i came to japan for the first time for one year when i was 17 years old and studied it for for one uh, one solid year uh but i always had an interest in <clears throat> japan and the japanese language because my my second eldest brother married my Japanese sister-in-law when I was eight years old. So at that time, she taught me, you know, like how to count to, how to, count to 10, how to say thank you and you're welcome and, and all sorts of stuff, how to use chopsticks. <laughs> so I, I had been uh, exposed to Japan, the Japanese language, uh, from a very, you know, when I was eight. Okay. But I mean, as far as applying yourself, how long did it take? Cause this is something I'm interested in, but I find I, I had some exchange students when I went to high school that I was good friends with from mm-hmm. Japan, uh, two young ladies, and they helped me out a lot, but it's hard to retain knowledge, number one, and Japanese is not the easiest language to learn when English mm-hmm. is your first language, you know? Actually, Japanese is, I don't, I didn't find the actual language itself, the, the vocabulary and the grammar are not that hard, I don't think, because it's, I, 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 I liken it to Lego. Once you learn your basic verbs from the dictionary, you just kind of add a piece on to say past tense or want or, you know, past progressive, right? But, um, but the, key, the key to learning any language, I think, is, is being immersing yourself in the culture and just using it immediately 
after whatever you've learned, use it immediately. And don't be afraid of making mistakes. Um, of course, you, I, well, I want to go back a little bit and say that I don't mean to say that Japanese is, you know, like, what are you, stupid? The Japanese is easy. That's not what I meant. The real hard, the real difficulty is getting past a certain level in Japanese because you have to learn the, all the different writing styles, the kanji, the katakana, and the hiragana. Because after a while, the, even the textbooks don't have romaji, you know, the Roman alphabet written right. above the kanji. So that's where I ran into trouble. I don't, didn't have really much of an aptitude for, for the written language. But the spoken language, I had a real aptitude. I think it comes from having a musical ear. And, uh, and it took me, um, well, the, the first time I was here, my, my visit got cut off because my dad had a heart attack. So I wasn't able to study the full year. So I went back to America. I came back this time when I was 26, almost 26. That time, I applied myself a little bit harder. I was a little bit older, so I could understand what was going on better. And uh, that uh, it took me about a year before I felt that I could get by, you know, with just every day, with every day speaking. Uh, you were asking how long it takes. Uh, uh, but I was, I, as I said, I'd already had that background, you know, from when I was eight, then again from when I was 17. So I moved up kind of quickly until, I, until it became important for me to use kanji more. And that's where I slowed down quite a lot. <laughs> Okay, and, and so what was your first job that required you to use Japanese language? You know, I didn't really have to use it that much just living and working in Japan because, first of all, especially during the, the uh, bubble economy of the 80s when I was here that time, uh, 80s and 90s, they, well, the bubble economy burst here the first time in uh, 1989. Um, 88, 89, I think it was. Uh, at that time, and even now, English is considered, I want to, I can't, I can't think of the English word for it, kakui. Um, I guess cool, you know, trendy. It still is. It still is very much so. But back then, it was a real big deal. So uh, people pretty much uh, would go out of their way to speak English to you. In fact, to the point where when I would speak Japanese to a, to a Japanese person, they'd see my gaiji, my foreigner face, my gaijin face. And I would be speaking fluent Japanese to them, but they'd say, I don't speak English, <laughs> so, but I'm speaking Japanese to you. And they really couldn't get it into their heads. You know, they'd see this face. <laughs> it was quite funny, actually. Sometimes very frustrating and not funny at all. But now looking back on it, it was funny. <laughs> so I didn't actually, oddly, did not actually need to use my Japanese much until 2000 when I started doing uh, uh, mixed martial arts, when I started doing Pride. Uh, and I got, I kind of got known in Japan for being you know, a certain personality, so that I would go on, I would do interviews, I would do commercials in both Japanese and English. Uh, now I use it quite a lot. There are several programs that I narrate here in Japanese. So, you know, it, it took a long time before I used it for my work, really. And so how did you get your start in Pride? I mean, were you in the martial arts scene before this? Or? No, I was not aware at all. Uh, in fact, it was quite, quite new. In Japan, it was new, too. It was, it was, and it was a fledgling uh, was new sport at the right. time uh and uh, uh i got a phone call i've told this story so many times it might sound like i'm just doing it by rote sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, two, two days before the world the uh, grand prix at the tokyo dome in, uh, in may 2000 just right before my birthday uh in may 2000 uh, i got a phone call from my agent saying there's some kind of boxing match happening at the Tokyo Dome the day after tomorrow and they want someone who's fluent in Japanese and who won't be afraid to to, uh, to uh, be performing in front of uh, uh, you know uh, 40,000 people you know plus alpha with all the broadcasts uh, and I said eh, well I don't know anything about boxing but um, if they're okay with that if they're okay that I don't know anything about boxing do I need to know anything no no you don't need to know anything about it. Oh, okay well yeah sure I'm free a day you know day after tomorrow so it's very serendip serendipitous Wow. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, it didn't turn out to be boxing at all. But <laughs> and so you get, you have a plan. Uh, you're, and you're fading. Your, your voice is going in and out a little bit. Can you start again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you hear me okay now? I can now. Yeah. I can now. All right. Yeah. Hold on just one second. Here, let me make sure. I think it was just because I'm going to turn my video off. Um, so, so when you get to the Tokyo Dome, did you have a, a plan in mind as to how you were going to do this? I mean. No. No, and, uh, and, you know, and I often have the philosophy of, you know, too much planning can screw you up, especially when it comes to, oh, well, specifically when it comes to, in, in other areas, maybe not the case, but when it comes to performance, live performance, if you plan too much and something goes differently from the way you'd planned it, it can really screw you up. You have to be able to think on your feet. And in this case, of course, I knew nothing. 
So I had to walk in there pretty much as a blank page, only knowing that I have to look decent and I've got to sound good, right? And I've got to pay attention and, you know, listen to what's going on and ask whatever questions I feel are necessary, follow the, you know, instructions and my, and my directors, uh, my director, you know? Right. So, you know, pay attention, listen and learn. It was basically my, uh, my, um, I keep wanting to use Japanese words, mokuteki, my, my motivation, my, my, my goal. Yeah. <laughs> this was what pride was what pride pride started in 99 right uh 98 i think i i don't yeah good that's a i didn't know it was going to be a history lesson <laughs> if i knew we were going to have a history test on mma i would have studied, no, uh, I studied that no i think yeah you might be right 99 number pride was this then i think it was uh a pride seven or something like that yeah i think i, I had yeah, a really really early I had it written down. I thought it was either six or seven on my notes right in front of me. Um, well, that's amazing, Lenny. I mean, just to hear that you went to the stadium not knowing. Had you ever performed in front of a crowd? I know that you have some jazz singing background and just some singing background. Yeah, and mu musical theater, acting in New York, and yes, here in, in Japan as well. Um, I don't think I'd ever been in a stadium as large as the Tokyo Dome performing yet by that time, at that time. But yeah, no, I mean, after a certain point, after a certain number of people, a large crowd is just a large crowd. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, you know, 5,000, 10,000 or 50,000. Uh, so I, and you also, that's one of the most important things, along with not planning too much, being able to think on your feet, paying attention, listening concentrating another important thing is you can't worry about the audience if you do you're just going to drive your, you're going to be paralyzed with with uh with uh, stage fright right so yeah I, I didn't think about that i still to this day i never think about that i think about if i perform to you know like with my jazz band too like i'll perform to the people i see i'm not uh, you know i'm not i'm not acting as if i'm in a studio or you know singing to myself right <laughs> uh, but you know one I, I, every single person out there is one person and that's the way i treat it well, that's amazing to hear. So, so, <laughs> so you do this show, and what was the reaction? I mean, surely you had to have some reaction from the president, somebody who was just blown away. I assume. Well, I think they were surprised. What happened was, I, you know, of course, I didn't know what was going on in the beginning. I just basically followed the Japanese. Uh, they would give me certain things they wanted me to say that you know that were only in English, and uh, and then when they they were telling me that you know to call the athletes out. And I, the thing is, I, even as a kid growing up, well, you know, you watch these old black and white movies about boxers, you know, the champ and all that. And the guy would go into the ring with his white shirt and his black bow tie. He'd pull the microphone down from the ceiling. And like he was calling his hogs in for slop. In the red corner. It was so boring, right? And, and these guys are getting into the ring. You know, they've got all, they've got this amazing dedication, uh, the training, the sacrifices they have to make, and this very courageous thing that they're going to be doing, entertaining this mass, these massive crowds. And you introduce them like that? That's terrible, right? So not enough pomp and circumstance. I had already always thought that, right? So I'm sitting there just announcing, you know, following the Japanese and, thinking this, this is not right you know after i'd seen a couple of matches so i think it was uh uh Ricardo Rodrigo? i can't remember what athlete it was um that i just that it because the name was spanish i rolled my r's on the on the introduction for his name uh -huh. and uh got a great reaction and i it was almost like oops shoot, shoot sorry i got creative and artistic oops is that okay and i looked over at my director and he was just beaming he loved it and i said is that, oh, is that okay and he said yeah that's okay so it's just, you know so i went ahead and let my my art the art you know the, the artistic side of it come out and uh, i had a much better time for the rest of the day and so from that very one the thing is i was supposed to just be a temporary substitute for the girl who was doing it already and uh, I, I and I actually knew her. She was a, a colleague of mine at a at a radio station, uh, Bay FM, where I was a disc jockey. And uh, I felt really bad that they asked they they asked me to come back instead of her. <laughs> so I became a regular. <laughs> wow, that's 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 amazing. I can tell you, just as a fan, hearing it the first time, which was you know probably two thousand before I started watching Pride because they weren't live. Okay, so I had to wait. So I was getting my hands on some DVDs and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt exactly what you were saying. I've been a boxing fan my whole life. I used to watch some wrestling, things like this. And that was why I gave you that introduction, because it's the truth to me. It sets the tone of the night. 
from the opening ceremony, and it makes every fighter, every fighter I've spoken to feel special to have you, uh, you know, introduce them. It, it, you just do so much more than you realize, Lenny. I, th I think, <laughs> I did it. for me as a fan, it's amazing. It's like, wow. And so that was my number one question is, how in the world would somebody even come up with this talent, you know? And, okay, so so following along there, you you got better as the years progressed. I assume you know that as well. Um, and not that you were ever bad, but you your tones even got better and better as the songs have changed. Like recently at Ryzen 14, there's more rap songs now than there ever was at any Japanese event that I can remember. Um, you change your tonal tonal range. I would I, I would say was that something that you practiced then? I don't practice it. I, again, it's because um, I, I never hear that. Usually, almost always, I do a lot of different events around the world, and in some of these events, I'll receive the the walkout music beforehand. Okay. I don't lie, and this is what I used to do when I used to work for One Fighting Championships, or they're called One Championships now. When I used to work for One, they'd send me the music beforehand, and I would time it just like I used to when I was a disc jockey. And that's just the way that production worked. Um, when I do Ryzen, when I used to do Pride, Dream, most organizations that I work for, I never hear the music until I'm sitting there. I don't know what music it's going to play until it starts. Wow. So, so I have to stay flexible because I'm never, you know, and also things change, right? So if I've got, damn, I timed this out to be this time, and, you know, the guy up in the sound booth starts the record maybe, you know, 30 seconds into the song, then I've got to, I got to do it on the fly, right? So right. again, I try to keep, I try not to rehearse too much. I try not to go in too prepared because what I have to do is I have to listen to my muse at the moment. I've got to feel what the crowd is feeling. Sometimes the crowd is so hyped up right. that if you try to, if you try to, you know, do anything bigger than what they're already feeling, it's going to have the opposite effect. And it's just, you know, people shouting at each other kind of thing, right? The best right. thing to do is bring it down a little, right? I, I also listen to the style of the music. I try to listen to the lyrics and see if they have anything to do with that because the athletes choose their walkout music themselves. And it's, you know, their choice. They, there's a reason why they chose that, right? right. So right. Is, it, is it funny? You know, is it, you know, is it really serious? And, you know, um, is it more nationalistic? Is it funky and cool? You know, so, I mean, one of my favorite, actually, I got to tell you about this one because a lot of people don't know it was me. One of my favorite um, uh, times that this happened where you have to sort of like do it ad lib, off the cuff, listen to your muse, pay attention to the crowd around you, was when uh, Crone Gracie, uh, did uh, did a rise and it was like three years ago I think it was, and uh, he came out to a, to a, to a uh, uh, I'm assuming it was an Australian song. It was instrumental, yes. very um, I, the, in Japanese we say shibui, kind of dark uh, song, and it was a didgeridoo. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do with this, right? Because <laughs> the crowd was really hyped too. They're really looking forward to watching Cron Gracie. And I thought, okay, well, obviously, his name alone, I could have said Cron Gracie, and people would have gone nuts because it's just, he's a Gracie, right? <laughs> but I, I did roll the R on the on the, on the Cron, which is one of my signature things, uh -huh. but I actually mimicked the sound of a didgeridoo. So, it, like, it came out as Cron Gracie, and it probably doesn't sound very good in this recording, <laughs> but it sounded pretty cool <laughs> in Saitama Super Arena, right? And even my own manager, who, who was sitting right, ne right next to the bell, he didn't realize it was me. He thought it was part of the song. And I thought, damn, that one, that one was really good. Nobody even knows I did it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Yeah, oh my God. It, it was, I mean, it's, I, like, for me, it's one of the highlights. It's like, what are your top ten favorite calls you ever did, Lenny? Well, that's one of them. And a lot of people don't know it was me. <laughs> that, that's so interesting because I've talked to fans on Reddit forums all over the place that they're going to be amazed to hear this story that it was you. I had wondered, everyone always talks about his walkout music. He only fought a few times in Ryzen. I believe that was his fight against Tetsuya uh, Kawajiri, by the way. But, yeah, uh, you're, you're, you know that better than, than I, because I see so many fights. I don't, I cannot, it's hard for me to keep track of them. <laughs> sure, that's going to be a gem for fans, because I wasn't even 100% sure on that until I heard his music later on, went back and watched the replay, but that that's unbelievable. Um, so <laughs> you said you've been, uh, I mean, you've been there through it all, through the greats. We just saw Miracle Kokop sadly have to retire. Um, what was, uh, what would you say your highlight of, of your time with Pride Rising has been? You know, just one of your top five moments. 
Oh, that's really hard to say. Um, I suppose just because of, you know, I'm an American. And so when Don Fry came out with the American flag, when we had our first, was it Dream or Pride? I don't know what, which one it was. It must have been uh, Pride uh, after 9-11. Oh yeah, you know, that was right. pretty intense. Uh, Probably the uh, one of the uh, ri uh, ri the rising that we did, where we did a memorial for um, uh, Kevin Randleman. It's probably yeah. the only time you'll you'll see me caught on camera crying <laughs> because we gave him the ten bells. Uh, uh, and those and those are just you know non fight related. As far as fight goes, fights go. Almost every single fight I have ever seen. Um, um, man fight because <laughs> he's amazing. Oh. Uh, intense Bushido spirit on that guy. Uh, and every Crow Cup fight, pretty much, too. Um, yeah. Uh, and that doesn't, yeah. Well, man used to take on, they might look at his record even mm -hmm. back and, and not think much of him. He used to take on everybody. All the bigger guys. He he was one. Oh of yeah, it didn't matter whether he won or not. He was just an incredible fighter. He was he was yeah he was great. And then of course he had that long, that long winning streak right before his retirement. Unfortunately, it had to happen because he had a stroke. But um, he does go out on a high note. So yeah, I, all of Crook Up stuff is great. And of course yeah. Fedor. Uh, I mean, I was able to see the you know all the best of the first generation of the best. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, so that's it's really hard to say. I mean, I I you I will use this analogy often. To ask me what my favorite fights were was would be like asking me which what's my favorite sunset, you know. Each one is beautiful. Each one is amazing on its own, and it's very very hard for me to say, you know. Okay, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, so uh, so there you go. <laughs> and I, I would never expect you to pick a favorite fight. I you know you. <laughs> good no, I can't fight. even pick top ten. I, I've just seen so many great ones. You know, is um, what I mean. Let's let's skip forward a little bit to this last New Year's Eve. Um, you you had laryngitis, or what was your? Um, I've never. I had I've had laryngitis twice. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got it right after. New Year's because at the end of the year I work the most. There's, there are all the year-end specials and live concerts and uh, and sporting events that I do. So my busiest time is pretty from October right up to and including New Year's uh, New Year's Day basically. Uh, so and I got laryngitis a few years ago when I was doing a real lot of work and a lot of recording work. I was working overseas a lot, but I did that didn't happen until January. So I had to cancel some of my band's concerts. Okay. Uh, that's the one time that I actually got proper real laryngitis. But what happened on New Year's Eve this last time, it wasn't so much laryngitis as it was just, uh, you know, ear, nose, and throat were, eye, ears, nose, and throat were all weak because I had influenza. And uh, <clears throat> it was quite bad, uh, very bad. <laughs> and it's uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Uh, I had a 42-degree uh, temperature. And we had a very long day because we had the uh, earlier, uh, yeah. I can't remember what we called it, uh, so we had uh, so it's like 16 fights in the afternoon and then another, I don't remember how many. It was crazy. Uh, but I was working straight through from 9.30 a.m. until after midnight. Yeah, I was in the 20, 26 fight range, something like that. Something I, I like, yeah, but then you got to remember that it's not just that. I do the opening for both. I did the opening. So, you know, the, uh, what's called Zen Senshu Shokai, which is the all-athlete intro. Uh, so that's, that's actually one of the hardest things to do for the whole day because you're pumping up the crowd, right? Then I had to do the uh, intros for both Red and Blue Corner, and then the winners Red and Blue Corner, and you know, so, and also the inter you know introductions for all the special stuff that was happening, you know, with uh, you know giving away awards or any special performance, things like that. The round numbers, the you know seconds out, all that. That you know. that's Lenny speaking on behalf of every fan out there. I was more than impressed because <laughs> I heard rumors about it. That, you know, Lenny, and then I, I listened to the Aronoka card, of course, that was earlier in the day, and you could tell that you weren't your normal self, the mm -hmm. place wasn't mm -hmm. vibrant, but you, from the la I thought she's going to lose her voice by the end of the night, and Lenny, I tell you what, the, the real main event for me was Horiguchi and uh, Caldwell. Oh, wasn't he great? <laughs> wasn't he great? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I, I kind of wish Floyd Mayweather wasn't on that show just because... I wish that would have been the main event. Oh, I think called. people here, people in the stadium, thought that was the main event. That's for sure. I mean, the the, the last, the last, the last uh, match with Mayweather was just, you know, a little yeah. eye candy, a little eye candy for people. But yeah, I managed to get through that, and Hori Gucci, I was glad that I was able to do a pretty decent call for him. Um, Mayweather didn't come out so cool, you know. I mean, I, I, I just that was my, that was, that was like squeezing the very last bit of toothpaste after the, you know, at the end of the, the tube of toothpaste, and that was it. And I actually I didn't even watch the fight. I got up and I had to go up, get up and leave. 
Wow. I mean, I watched the I watched the fight from my dressing room on the monitor, but uh, yeah, yeah, I couldn't sit I couldn't sit there. But, but I also didn't really want to sit there and see poor Tenshi and get beat, beaten up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the I, fact that he couldn't kick it was there was no contest involved there before the fight even started. Right, and I think people don't realize that you also uh, as to, speaking of so down Joe, they they play off of you a lot, and so there's a I'm lot. Sorry, of, say that say that one more time. Speaking with uh, Frank Trigg and Showdown oh, Joe, yeah, they have they have to play off you a lot as well, and you're kind of sitting across from them, correct? And we don't hear each. other. I can't hear them. I don't. I don't have. I'm not tuned into the to the. I'm, I'm a direct feed. I'm I'm tuned into the PA system. See, so I don't I don't hear them at all. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what they're saying at all. Yeah, it's a, it, I don't know how much of these you rewatch, but that's unbelievable because the the seamlessness that you guys all do it with and. And when everyone's quiet, I, I mean, I've told people all the time, if you want to arrive an event, you've got to watch one really for the presentation alone. Um, I try to describe it to people as better than a rock concert, but sort of like a rock concert. That <laughs> The principles are all there. The principles are exactly the same. Because I do rock concerts, too. Well, like, I do J-pop. Right, I do the like. There's a very famous Japanese group here called Momoyuto Clover Z. They're actually famous worldwide if you're into Japanese pop and all girl bands and all, right? And they're they're hugely popular. I mean, we fill stadiums larger than than Pride filled. You know, we do Yokohama Arena, so that's like fifty thousand or something like that. Uh, and that that's a rock. That's basically the same principle as a rock concert. So yeah, actually, Ryzen does work very much like a rock concert. So did Pride. And the credit goes completely to the production team. They're they're. They are amazing. And I've never worked with any group of people that are better at this than the Japanese. The real pride in their work, they really listen to each other. They they have they don't have attitude problems, you know. If a boss tells them to do something, they do it and they do it well. And they're supportive of each other. Um, I love working in Japan and for the Japanese people. They're amazing. Uh, I can only imagine. Uh, how, how much longer do you plan to do this? Uh, well, if you give me a microphone, I'll do it from uh, my grave. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> you know, recently people have been talking about the one championship thing, which I don't need to get too deep in. We all know what the deal is. There. Yeah. But uh, you know, recently people have been talking about that, and it got me thinking, what would we do without Lenny Hart? I mean, I want <laughs> to know and to all the fans I speak to, to people like Shinju Eclair, who wanted me to tell you hello, and she loves what you do. To me and Yamamoto, <laughs> these fans, honestly, you're, you're giving them fuel in this opening ceremony. Every one of them has told me that. And then, but people like me and Yamamoto are telling me, Lenny Hart is making us famous worldwide. And <laughs> of, of this, I'm sure you know how highly your peers think of you. But as a fan, I could see it happening. But I'm also telling these fighters, well, you got to give yourself some credit. You're going out there and fighting, you know. <laughs> of course. It's, it is, it's the fighters. I, I, I am glad that I'm doing my job well and making them feel pumped and good when they come out. Making their fans feel pumped and look, look forward to, you know, what's about to this amazing event that's about to take place right in front of their eyes and the, and the, and the, and the athletes that they support. I'm doing my job if I'm making the athletes look even better than they already are. I've got goose flesh right now <laughs> thinking about that. So when, when you told me this, when you just told me that, uh, you know, about uh, Eau Claire and, and uh, Yamamoto and all, that's, that makes me feel really great. I mean, you're talking about Mew Yamamoto, my gosh. They, nice. They're, the, you know, MMA royalty of Japan. They're the Gracies of, of Japan. So, for, you know, for them to say something like that is obviously really touching. <laughs> One reason you're doing Hanichu on this episode is because you're going to be with Shinju and you, so it's going to kind of be an all-female uh, rising and, uh, cool. and yeah, so they both just spoke so highly about you. But one thing I wanted to also ask you was the the Typhoon Night Rising Thirteen. Um, did you guys know? <laughs> did you know that the Typhoon was coming before you entered the arena? Sure. And okay. so you knew that you knew the thing. <laughs> get changed and not really an opening ceremony like usual we uh well we knew the typhoon was coming but we didn't know that there was going to be uh you know an early end to the to the event and all because of it until we found out that uh japan railway was going to shut the trains down so it's the very first time that we didn't do an all athlete intro but of course no one had a problem with that we understood why and that decision was made based on what japan the, the official railway system at japan rail the, the transportation ministry 
uh, closed off and also closed off some of the expressways. So we needed to be able to get our fans home from, from the arena. Uh, so and up until that point, we didn't know that they were going to do that. You, you never, you know, it depends on how strong you, a typhoon is very unpredictable. And we're so, you know, we're right here on the coastline here in Tokyo. So we are in a little alcove, so it's 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 pretty rare for our typhoon to actually really hit Tokyo. Usually it dissipates before it gets here, it's a little bit out to sea, or more frequently it goes straight up to Hokkaido or, or Okinawa, poor Okinawa gets hit all the time. Uh, but that's, you know, further down. So uh, uh, it, it, it was not it was not irresponsible of us to go ahead and, you know, start the show it was not, you know, not, not a problem at all. All the fans came out. But we were we did the responsible thing to make sure that no one was injured, to make sure that everyone was able to get home safely, and we cut the show down, and I think that was the right thing to do. So uh, yeah. yeah, we we did know about the typhoon, we just didn't know we were going to have to uh, cut the the, sh the show short and have a problem with our broadcast too with Fuji Television, of course. There was still a lot of fans in the arena even after the eight p.m. cutoff time or whatever, though. There there were yeah a lot. I think a lot of people opted to just you know uh, uh, you know. Uh, hunker down and weather out the storm. Uh, I know that there was a facility made available at, at Saitama by Ryzen for people to go and stay for those who did get stuck. Uh, a lot of the people there, um, we don't really have, we have parking is more for like VIP underneath Saitama Super Arena. So VIP, so that means a lot of the arena seats are for, you know, the people are paying 100,000 yen. I don't know what that is in dollars. Uh, let's, let's see. Uh, what was 100,000 100, yen is $1,000, I think, about. Uh, for their tickets, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know they're they've cut they've come in their cars, right? In their SUVs and their you know their big cars, okay. but they're in the garage underneath, so they can hang out there. So you figure there are at least ten thousand, what maybe twelve thousand people, that w wouldn't have a problem staying. And I think more than that did stay, actually. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that would just go over to Denny's or McDonald's or something and hang out until the storm ended. Hey, mm -hmm. I was surprised. I had a friend that went to that show and he had left early. Because of the railway system and his hotel was days away, um, but looking at the crowd and rewatching that show, I, I think it's percent at least of the people stayed in that arena. Which you know, I, have, I wanted to ask you about that because is, is Saitama far away from from things? I mean, is that is that yeah, kind pretty, of it's pretty well inland? Yeah, I mean, we're not on you know, it's further in. I think. Let me think now. Yes, of course it is. It's further inland than Tokyo. Okay. But the main, okay. the main reason is it's not so much that they were worried that there was going to be flooding or anything or even that much wind damage necessarily in Saitama itself. Saitama is a prefecture, right? And it's mm -hmm. about 40 minutes away by train from where I live in Tokyo. And uh, so it's not so much that they're worried that there's going to be, you know, w you know, damage to buildings or flooding or anything like that so much as... Uh, you know, pe people walking around, if the winds are strong enough, it can be quite dangerous. Things can fly off and off. Mostly it was because you can't just stop the trains in Saitama. You know what I mean? <laughs> if the trains stop in Saitama, then that means all those trains that were supposed to be going from Saitama to Tokyo are not doing that run. There aren't that many tracks, right? You've got several different trains running on the same tracks. So it, since the transportation ministry decided it was too dangerous to have the trains running, because there's a lot of overhead, you know, L, elevated uh, areas and stuff too, and debris on the tracks and strong winds, that will affect the trains. And that was the main reason. How, how long have you lived in Japan? Uh, I just turned, was it 31 or 32 <laughs> years here? I and and what it is. Do you lived in the States before that? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm from the United States. I was born in America. I was born in Alaska, oh. Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, wow. I'm triple wow. A. I just realized that I just realized it's triple A. I'm triple I've got triple A rating. Anchorage, oh. Alaska, America. <laughs> <laughs> and so you went to school and stuff there until, Sorry, you're, until you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I went to school. I that's another that's a, that's a uh, conversation for another day. My schooling was quite unusual, uh, but yes, I was in America until I was. I never left the United States, with the exception of uh, Canada and Mexico, uh, until I was 17 and I came to Japan the first time. Wow, what a yeah. crazy. Yeah, well, I definitely want to have that conversation because it sounds interesting. Let me get to a couple of fan questions. I know you don't have much time. Um, I got one here. Uh, just a cheap to the junk wants to know. What's who? Yeah, cheap to the junk is this guy's name. You might know him off uh, Twitter. He's real, real, okay. real, 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 real into Japanese MMA. Knows it sounds that. familiar. That's why I asked you to repeat it because you are breaking up a little bit. Cheap to the junk. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he wants to know what kind of music you listen to. 
And if your microphone delivery is influenced by a particular singer or instrumentalist. Mm. Um, I... I, I, my singing is influenced by some singers. Sarah Vaughn comes to mind right away. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, no, that's just one. There are many. Right. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, what, what kind of music I like, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, my music, you know, when I play my, my, my you know, I have, you got your Apple, I got Apple music on, and I download song, you know, albums that I like and all, right? Then when I put it on shuffle and, and just put it on songs to play, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed myself with how many different genres I've got. So <laughs> I lean toward jazz, uh, funk, rhythm and blues. Uh, I lean toward that, but I also like musical theater. I like some country and Western. I like some uh, good old rock and roll. I like some country rock. Uh, I like uh, uh, some uh, acid jazz. Probably one of, the, one of the things I don't, I like some reggae. I, mean, I like everything. Probably, wow. I, I'm not that fond of uh, um, electronic music. Uh -huh. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, if you saw if you if you saw my list on my Apple my Apple playlist, uh, you'd be like, yeah. what? Really? This is one person song list? <laughs> that sounds really really diverse. I'm not that into the electronic stuff either. It doesn't seem to have much uh, much melody, you know. I just I think every time I hear it, I can tell that it's just not an actual music. You know, they're not individual musicians on instruments, and it I it sounds less alive to me i like some of it don't get me wrong i like some of it but i wouldn't buy it and play it you know on my own if it comes I, on the radio there are some that i like you know but you know what about, I, what about bands I, like, I miss the live i miss the live feeling you know what i mean <laughs> what about bands like pink floyd or, or oh love pink floyd yeah well oh. i started to say I, I thought i thought i was listening too many but what are you so uh, yeah of course the classics pink floyd uh your your uh your uh, the theme music i'm assuming is credence clearwater revival yes well, no, that my theme music is the Rising theme music, but of course that's what the podcast uh, you, aimed yeah, at. Yeah, Bad at. Moon Rising, right? Yeah. I'm not, the, not trying to use any copyright stuff, so I got permission from Rising themselves to use their theme music. Uh, that's cool. But eventually, you know, hopefully I'll transition to being able to get some permission from Clearwater. Maybe you could just make do some kind of a mix. There's where electronic music comes in handy. Do a mix, maybe fade one into the other. I'll oh, do a mashup. That'd be cool. That, that's an excellent thought. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? That <laughs> amazing. Um, okay, and the other one would be, if you have ever been starstruck meeting a fighter. Okay, whose question is this? This is t another question from Teep. Okay. Um, starstruck meeting a fighter. Let me think. Hmm. Or, or me? You know, I suppose the very first time I met Vanderlei, I was. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of starstruck every time I meet all of them. It depends on how you define starstruck. I mean, I'm not the kind of person that gets starstruck, really, because as a performer, you know that they're performers, you know? And, you know, when you have people come up and they ask for your autograph and they ask for your photograph and, you know, they talk to you like, you know, and they, get, they get all excited and nervous and all. I know what it's like to, to, to receive that a little bit in a very small, small way. And it's sometimes hard to respond to it. You know what I mean? Right. So if I meet someone, like I've met famous actors and singers and, you know, directors and athletes. Um, and um, it, it, if I were them, I wouldn't want someone to be freaking out over me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'd want them to just say, I really respect you. I really love your work. Or, you know, I enjoyed such and such a movie you, you did, you know. And so I tr I, that's the way I react to them. So, But I guess if I were the closest thing that I could come to uh, what you would might define as starstruck would probably the, be the first time I met Vanderlei face to face. Actually, was introduced to him and spoke to him. And that was after you had seen him fight, I assume. Yeah, I would have been one of the, the Pride used to always have after parties inside the arena. Oh. And uh, the, you know, they they give away the sort of like your most valuable player thing. They'd give uh, to special select super fans who would be invited to come. They would give uh, signed gloves, stuff like that. I mean, I know I hear these books about people saying that the, the pride fighters were real wild party animals and everything. And I think some of the fighters themselves would like that myth to be true, but it's not. And uh, these the whole things about, you know, cases of champagne being poured over their heads and all that is absolutely not true. Um, you know, don't believe the hype. <laughs> oh, there's another band I like. The, uh, the, the uh, hypocrisy. Uh -huh. oh. You know what I'm thinking of? I can't think of the full name. I uh, know. 
this one's real, so believe the hype. Don't believe the hype is a sequel. And uh, television, the drug of a nation, feeding ignorance and reading radiation or whatever the words are. <laughs> Sorry, you just got a little song there. Um, <laughs> it, it's called hypocrisy. Something, something hypocrisy. You're, you're uh, fading out on me. I, I'm, I'm, I, you're, you're popping out in and out. Can you hear me okay? I was actually. Okay, just, now I can hear you. Now I was actually you. Just laughing because that was. Uh, I was. What, what a series would be to just put Lenny up for some songs and make her recite some lyrics. Because. <laughs> Do you know the you know the, the the rap group that I'm referring to? Quite a serious political rap group, the incredible something of hypocrisy. Yeah. Uh, just put just in put input when you look it up later and put input hypocrisy. It's a play okay. on words, hypocrisy, right? You know when you started reciting some of those lyrics, so that reminded me. But I, geez, I'm not. I, I listen to so much music as well, Lenny, that it's really hard for me to even remember. Uh, song titles. Or... <laughs> well, see, I used to be a disc jockey, so I used to be very good at remembering titles and who did the guitar, you know, <laughs> who replaced the guitarist for that session and all that, because it's what I used to talk about on the radio all the time. But if you're interested in what I was just talking about, look up, or if your listeners are, look up hypocrisy. Just you put that one word in there and then put the word television, and it'll def definitely bring up these guys. They're awesome. amazing. Well, I'll let them know you recommended it. <laughs> And Did so, I wind up answering your question, by the way? <laughs> I, can't, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, the influence, influence, musical influences, right, right? And what kind of music I like? Was that it? Yeah, and I was also just wondering if your if your background in musical, uh, you know, all this all the stuff that you've done throughout. Oh, your has it? Yes, definitely. But I've been obviously what I do is also I was a a, a voice actress and a narrator, voice actress, as well as an announcer. And I was a news announcer too. So I've used my voice to tell stories, to sing songs, uh, to paint a picture, if you will. Um, I mean, I remember one time I was doing, I think it was, it was either for Sesame Street or Disney, I can't remember. And the, I had three characters. I had to be a red triangle, a blue ball, mm -hmm. and a yellow rectangle, I think it was. And they were like moving around and singing songs and doing that. And I had to, I had to imbue them with personalities. So, you know, like, I think I treated the rectangle, you know, since it had the sharp point with sort of a high sort of little nerdy voice and the little blue ball, the blue ball had to be like sort of, I thought, thought he'd be like kind of fat and bounce to the world, you know. So I, when I had to come up with these characters, that, I have to make a character with my voice. So definitely yeah. that is what I do for the calls. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I think about the personality of the, of the fighter, the mood of the crowd, the nuance of the music, everything. And so, we've yeah. also... You've also done video game work, right? You were Anna. A lot of video game works, and I cannot really quote them to you because I don't play them myself. Um, I think probably the most famous is Tekken. Yeah, you were I Anna. Did, like, yes. And yes. they've got a new one now, I think. I think they've they've replaced they've replaced it because they've they've updated it and they have someone else doing Anna now, I think. But yeah, I did Anna um, and I did uh, oh, I don't know. Fantavision. I was actually the uh, what do they call it? The guide voice for Fantavision. Uh, what is I? As I said, I don't play them. So, uh, well, yeah, Ramb uh, Ramblin' Ramblin' Rose. Does that make sense? Uh, Ramblin' Rose. Like, something not Ramblin' Rose. That's a song. Rumble Rose. Rumble, Rumble Rose. Rose. Sort of yeah. like sort of a cheap version of Tekken. <laughs> I guess. I encourage people. I was going to ask you a little bit about some of the other organizations you work with, but in the sake of time, I would just encourage people to go to your Facebook. You have quite a bit of them listed on mm. the site. Uh, on your profile, there. I don't know if I've ever seen something like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep. I try to keep. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm a very proud team player for whoever I'm working with. So I, I try to promote as much as possible uh, what and these people are doing. Also, very busy. I mean, what do you do in your in your downtime? If you mind me asking. Uh, I don't mind you asking. I suppose when I have, I like. I really like my Japanese bath, my ohuro. <laughs> you know, because they're really deep. They're shorter, but they're really deep, so you can really get goes right up to your neck. So I like candles in there, and I, I love. I like to listen to old time radio, OTR. You know, like the old Jack Benny shows and mysteries and stuff like that. I love listening to OTR. Uh, I walk my dogs. Uh, I listen to music. I work with my band. When I'm in health, I, I've been a little ill with. Uh, um, with uh, anemia, but when I'm healthier, I like walking and I like scuba diving. I like skiing. <laughs> so, but I don't often have uh, free time. So, <laughs> you ever been here to Colorado where I live? I used to live in Colorado. I lived in Boulder, Colorado for one year, from 1973 to 74, I think it was. 
Wow. Or 74 to 75. I don't remember now which. Boulder, Colorado. Great town. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's an amazing place. The reason I asked is because have you ever been to the Great Sand Dunes? I don't think so, no. They're down no, here in Colorado, and I'm, I'll send you a video at some point, but they make a booming sound from the sand grinding together as the wind blows. Ooh, cool. Really loud, booming sound. I just feel like someone as musically inclined as you would appreciate it. So I'm going to send yeah. a video recently of this uh it's unlike anything I've ever heard you know it's just a cool. really, really strange noise and really loud for grains of sand you know oh wow cool i'd love to hear that yeah you yeah. know i will tell you one story about colorado when i was living there went skiing at in aspen with some <laughs> wealthy wealthy friends of ours our family wasn't that rich uh wealthy friends of ours i you know invited the whole uh, you know our whole family up to go skiing with them and went to a party and was able actually danced with Let's see if I got it right, because I've met a couple of famous people there, but I danced with Robert Redford. That when you say starstruck, I was probably thir- ten years old, so I was pretty starstruck at that time. <laughs> oh, that, that was in Aspen, Colorado, huh? Yep, that was in Aspen, Colorado. Yeah, and you're breaking up again, so maybe we should. Um, and then whenever I talk, I can't hear you, so um, it's getting about. So I'm going to have to probably wrap it up anyway, because I'm I'm about half an hour late for my next <laughs> my next project. <laughs> so. Um, Thank you so much, and hopefully we could do this another time. I could talk to you for hours. I have so many things that I'd love to ask you, and I appreciate all your time. Um, well, thank you so much for all your time, Lenny. And I, I once again, my apologies for the for the time thing. I it was all my fault. I don't uh, don't take it out on Mal at all because it was all me. Uh, I, I know. I, sh- I know. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's really because Mal, Mal's from New Zealand, right? He might, he's from New Zealand, so he wouldn't even he wouldn't even know what MST is. In fact, it took me a second. I kind of forgot MST. Oh yeah, Mountain Standard Time. Yeah. Right. So- <laughs> Stop last night. I said twenty two and a half hours, and he said yeah. And then I I, I oh, yeah. late at night, and I it was. No worry. It worked out in the end. But hopefully we could do this again at some point, and uh, everybody can catch Lenny at Rising Fifteen uh, Quintet. Is what's your next show coming up, Lenny? The one. Uh, the next show coming up is Arzalet. And, well, I, I might be doing a show before that, but since it's not sure, I can't really say. <laughs> I'm going to find out it, hopefully within the day. Uh, but if so, this next weekend doesn't work out, then the next show I will be doing will be the weekend after that in Seoul, and it's Arzalet. Arzalet, okay. Yeah. And, and I'm going to let people know about that. And then your social media is all just at Lenny Hart? Um, I'm at Lenny Hart on Twitter, uh, just playing Lenny Hart on Facebook. Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, uh, Inst- Instagram is also Lenny Hart, yeah. Well, thank you so much once again, Lenny. This is an absolute honor and a privilege for me. As I said, I am a fan of yours. I will always be a fan of yours, and I'm <laughs> extremely thankful for this. Thank you very much, Zach. I enjoyed talking with you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.